Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for all of those who are attending this meeting. Um, I'd like to start as obviously the, one of the, the most important paper in today's agenda is the, um, is the Grenfell Expenditure Paper. So I would like to start with 72 seconds of silence, if you can all be seated and reflect. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start this meeting um, with uh, a few words on the process that we're planning on following. Um, obviously, we are relatively short on time because there is a, a, another meeting coming in here after this, uh, the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, so ideally, we need to vacate this chamber at 6.30 or as close to that as possible. Um, I apologize for this meeting being in the council chamber. Uh, it's not mine nor the officer's first choice, um, but I'm afraid given the combination of the enforced return to physical meetings, um, and complying to COVID guidelines, this is what we've got, and we will make the best of it. Um, in terms of the process, <clears throat> uh, I think we should proceed with the agenda as laid out. Um, when we get to it, uh, I'd like to cover A6 before A5, um, so that then we can get all more of the uh, let's call them administrative tasks of the committee completed first before going into the important Grenfell expenditure report. Then I'd like to say a few words with, regard, with regards to this report. Um, and then I'd like to call for those members of the public who have registered to speak uh, to speak. Um, I request that you Keep it to five minutes per person, um, and I will uh, notify you when four minutes is up, and I believe the lights are working, so this light here somewhere, somewhere will light up. That one uh, will light up at four minutes to notify that you have one minute left to go. Um, as I say, we've got a lot to get through, so please can you adhere to the time frames. Um, in terms of the order of the speakers, um, we have uh, Kimi Zabayan representing Grenfell Next of Kin. We have David O'Connell and Abbas Daidu from the Lancaster West Residents Association. And we have Caroline Ma of the Henry Dickens Estate. Is that correct? Where's David? I'm looking for him. That's correct. Excellent. OK. Um, once the speakers have spoken, um, and they will speak consecutively, uh, I will invite the officers to respond verbally to those questions that the speakers have posed. Um, I have also requested that officers um, compile a written response to every question, um, which we shall then publish. Uh, then we will go to the committee members 
for questions on the report. Um, and I'd like to start with the, the Vice Chair to pose the first question and then into the other members. Okay. Uh, into the agenda. Um, apologies for absence. Um, okay, we have apologies from Charles Williams, um, who is unable to attend, and for um, Councillor Emma Dent Code, who is also unable to attend at the last minute. Um, her daughter has been taken to hospital, and we wish her daughter the best. Um, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? Yes. My standing declaration of interest with Standard Chartered Bank, please. Thank you, Gazette. Now we move into the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of March, 2021. Uh, if I may start um, from Charles Williams, um, minutes A6.3. Um, with regards to the teacher pension scheme as centrally administered. Um, hold on, let me find that on here. Uh, is centrally administered unlike LGPS by the Department for Education. The task of providing assurances needed to complete the certi certificate will be easier if all schools for which the RB RBKC is responsible use the same payroll service. Um, I'll send a note through to Esme, um, who is taking the minutes, um, to amend that. Aside from that, any further comments on the minutes? Nope. Okay. Then those minutes I will sign, subject to Charles Williams' its addition. Um, moving on to A4, Forward Program and Action Tracker. Um, does anyone, we don't really need David to talk us through this, I assume. Does anyone have any comments on it? Um, any additions we should put in there? Obviously, it's a bit of a moving feast because new reports may come to light, particularly after this, after this meeting. Sorry, Liz, have you got a Yeah, comment? sorry, just on the, um, on the action tracker at A4, um, the item A5, independent review of property transactions, should be A6, and it was, wasn't the percentage change in the audit plan that I was querying, but it was the percentage change in materiality, because materiality increased from 1.4%, as I can recall, to 1.5%. And I was querying why that had happened. Sorry, this is in the minutes. Oh, in the minutes. Sorry. Is this in the minutes on the, no, no, or the no, action tracker? It's the action tracker. I can't see that on here. Well, sorry, A4, and it's 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 um, it's it says it's A5. It says independent review of property transactions. On page two. Oh, I see. Right. Yep. Okay. Got it. And uh, the thing that was queried was the change in the materiality percentage, not the change in the fees. Excellent. Uh, so a note for Esme. Okay. Um, and put that in, and David. Yeah. The, the only other point was on A7, um, summary of data to be circulated to the committee in advance of 25th of May. Um, I can't recall having received that. I can't recall that either, Taryn. Thank you. Yeah, apologies. I, it hasn't been circulated yet, so you haven't missed it, but it will be circulated immediately after this meeting. There's, there's two things, actually. One is the information on invoices as part of the IBC, and the other one was uh, the, uh, the, act, the issue raised by uh, Councillor Emmerdink Code around the underspends. Um, going back from 2010 to 2016. So that information is ready, so it will follow this meeting. Thank you. 
Any further comments? No. Nope. Q. Right. Now we're going to move. We're going to jump A5 for the time being. Go to A6. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chairman. Um, are we on, am I in the right place? Sorry. AC, yeah, the risk register itself. On risk ID 4, I just query, I was concerned that there were 30 overdue cases as regards gas safety performance and just what the implications of that were. And what I didn't understand is audit of fire compliance under the risk control in place in TMO being undertaken by Mazars. Um, Mazars are an audit firm. I wasn't sure why they'd be doing fire risk safety. So happy to pick both those up. Chair, so on the second point, Mazars actually provide internal audit services to us under a, a framework agreement uh, as part of the internal audit service. And for the first part, um, the, the information around gas safety checks relates to those properties which the housing service couldn't get access to properties and they're working with legal services to make sure access is obtained to carry out the gas safety checks. It rep represents a very small number of the gas safety checks that actually need to be completed uh, in terms of those 30 cases. Thank you. Any more? Poke your button. <laughs> what do Israel, Belarus, and Lithuania all have in common? <laughs> Other than they've been in the news in the last week. Not sure, Councillor Lindsay, happy to be enlightened. Uh, they've all got embassies in this borough. Mm. Don't tell me that the problems with Israel and the Palestinians in Gaza are going to go away overnight. They're not one can certainly envisage similar sorts of incident that happened on the Ryanair plane from Greece to Lithuania being taken off to Belarus happening again. I'm not saying there are any easy solutions, but I think we ought to flag up the fact that there are some 50 embassies in this borough as being a particular challenge. Yes, there are undoubtedly police. Yes, there are undoubtedly each embassy's own security, but if it were to get out of hand, that really would be a risk to the borough. If I may, Chair, thank you, thank you mm -hmm. Councillor Lindsay. So I'm happy to, to go back um, to, to speak with officers to bring a more detailed response, but I do know the County Terrorism Board meets regularly, which is a multi-agency board, in, in, including the police and so on, and that they, are, they, are, they have um, a review of the risks within the borough, um, so I'll make sure that we get some, some more information back to you in terms of how those specific risks are being managed. I don't think it's risks. I think there, there will always be risks and they will get worse. It's how we manage them and how, how well trained the relevant police and other authorities are to respond quickly before anything too serious happens. May I just say, uh, Chair, mm. uh, over the weekend indeed uh, our contingency arrangements were uh, in place, and we were working with the police over the last weekend, um, and there is uh, these arrangements. It, it, it stems from the counter-terrorism work, but actually uh, it really is about uh, security and police connections with us, because, as you say, uh, ourselves and Westminster, because of the preponderance of um, well, at Wandsworth as well, of course, with the American Embassy there, um, uh, and there's regular connections with the, uh, the Met Police at central level, not the local borough command. Thank you, Barry. Uh, one other point uh, that Charles Williams would like in here um, regarding risk eight and the external economic factors. Uh, his view is they should be reviewed and perhaps renamed to give greater weight to the impact on the borough's economy from increased working from home and the loss, at least in the short term, of overseas tourist business if we can incorporate that in there. Happy to take that away, Chair, to reflect that. Thank you. Great. One more. Just looking at um, numbers one, two, and three, the failure to meet 
the issues for one and two, they are substantially within our gift, as it were, that we can respond to them. But actually, number three, we can control to a much greater degree. We can control how well we build the housing in Lancaster West. There is, we can certainly respond how well we respond to the public inquiry and all the issues in number one. But actually, if, if, if there are heightened emotions as a result of it, we can't. So there's a qualitative distinction between what we have full control over and what we don't. Thank you, Chair. That's noted. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further comments, then now we shall move on to go back to A5. Excuse me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Gosh, because it's, it's so hard to see people in this room. That's part of the trouble. Sorry to interrupt, Chair. <laughs> Having never been mayor. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> My question is that it's in the right-hand column. It talks about dates to achieve target scores. There are many dates that have passed, actually. So I'm curious as to what the new dates might be and how it will be judged that the target will have been achieved. If, if, I, may, if I may, Chair, thank okay. you. That, uh, that's a really good point. So a lot of these risks are you know, risks you'd expect on many council strategic risk registers. They are ongoing risks that we are seeking to manage. Some of them are ones we expect to stay there for a very long time in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of safeguarding. The Risk and Control Board, which reviews the red register, meets tomorrow. So we'll be reviewing the dates tomorrow and then be able to feed back to the next meeting in terms of any, any changes to those dates or targets. Thank you. Um, and people just talk in if I haven't noticed that they're waving at me wildly for a question, uh, so I don't miss anyone. Um, right, A5. Um, so if I may start before we go into um, the public speaking part of the evening. Um, if I can just make a few points. The Audit and Transparency Committee is a committee held in public and is not a public meeting. Um, however, given the incredibly emotional, sensitive and important nature of this report, I've taken the decision to allow members of the public who have registered and who wish to speak and ask questions to do so. I wish to thank the officers for this report and the governance for coordinating this meeting, which has been no easy feat. To members of the public for attending, um, and I wish to thank Emma Dent Code, seeing as she is not here, um, for stressing the need for this report last year um, and for the support of the committee members um, for pursuing this report and bringing it to this point, um, and also for being committed to ensure that we reach a point that we are satisfied that we have examined the facts of this report and our questioning of this expenditure has been concluded. I must state that at this point I do consider this to be the first report into the Grenfell expenditure. Um, so this is the starting point, not the finish line of our inquiries from this committee. Any areas that we believe we need more information or more examination, we will pursue and request further information from the officers. As laid out in 2.4 of this report, the Audit and Transparency Committee is to provide independent scrutiny of the authority's financial and non-financial performance to the extent that it affects the authority's exposure to risk and weakens the control environment. The report then goes on to say that there is, of course, an overlap with the Overview and, Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which is being held at 7 p.m. in this chamber tonight. And it's that committee which is charged with examining the overall effectiveness of the Grenfell Recovery Strategy, which is why this report that we are looking at today is very factual in nature. In 
in my view, and this is a committee that I have been privileged to be chair of for, for nearly three years, I think, this is not a political committee, and I do encourage everyone to keep politics out of their questions as much as they possibly can and focus on the task in hand, which is transparency and assessing the risks and controls. I should also point out that we are holding this committee at a very, very sensitive time of the ongoing Grenfell inquiry. And we must try not to stray into matters that are on, in the purview of that inquiry. We must also recognize the importance of the privacy of the bereaved and the survivors of the Grenfell tragedy at all times. We must also remember that we are here to look at the Council's response and not to delve into individual institutions or organizations outside of the Council. As with any reports to this committee, we're obviously taking this report as having been read so that we can spend our time here this afternoon being as effective as possible. Thank you. Uh, I would now like to call the first speaker um, from Grenfell next of kin. Kimia. Thank you very much for allowing us to be here to participate in this meeting. Uh, we appreciate that. And after four years and half a billion pounds spent, we appreciate that we are getting our five minutes. But we thought that we would actually split it this amongst ourselves. So, whereas I, if I, so I hope you will go, you will bear with me if I go over the five minutes, because collectively we we will use up our 20 minutes. Because there is a lot, this is very important, and there is a lot to go into. And rather than ask officers to mark their own homework or this council to mark its own homework, I think you should be asking us what's really been going on, because we have chapter and verse on it. So, <clears throat> with that said, I'd like to say that after Grenfell Tower fire, hundreds of millions of pounds were spent by Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea, to support the victims and the community, except that it did not go to where it was supposed to go. A lot of mon the money came from central government or GLA, all of it public purse. What central government or the GLA or the taxpayers of RBKC do not know is that this public pur purse expenditure in the name of the victims and the traumatized community has been misspent, squandered, duplicated, and has been completely unaccountable in an unacceptable manner. With the council at the heart of a criminal investigation and a public inquiry and civil litigation, for the conditions where this tragedy of mass murder, mass manslaughter, forgive me, could occur, left, the, the council was left at the helm with no checks or, and balances or meaningful scrutiny. It is a double crime, or as one of the next of kin put it, first they kill you, then they ask you to pay for the bullet. Criminals were left in charge of the crime scene with a loaded gun, or another who said the abuser was left in charge of the abused. Despite the resources, the victims were still left with massive problems and issues which should have been simple enough for a functioning organization to sort out. Instead, an army of people and bureaucracies were employed, and the victims kept in a holding pattern of need and dependency. Who benefited? The council and their workers and their systems and chums, of course. The council collected data which was in its interests, given the litigation, and there was a clear conflict of interest. Furthermore, our contention is that not only was this immoral and possibly quite illegal, but that the same systems and dysfunctionality at the heart of this council, with the same attitudes and culture that we are hearing exposed daily at the inquiry, continued. Some people were moved on, and new people took on the roles, which included targeting and bullying, minimizing, and a culture of closed ranks and cronyism that has created an unbearable level of abuse in North Kensington for the victims. This so-called report is lacking in detail and rich in deliberate obfuscation. The Audit and Transparency Select Committee has given an, op has given an opportunity to the officers to provide a detailed report. And yet, it's come up with this. 
There is no other alternative but to call in outside independent auditors to track this massive spend and where all the money went and why and who made the decisions that have left a few thousand people at the mercy of a handful of people with unaccountable power at the expense of the public purse and the further re-traumatization of the traumatized. Our contention is that the vast sums of money and the uneven, unequal, unaccountable spend could have been avoided if an independent organization was left to handle the recovery and commissioners brought in, given the centrality of the council and what was a highly contentious and sensitive situation in the aftermath of a national tragedy. Not doing that has cost the taxpayer, as well as the victims, in further pain and re-traumatization, as well as clear, direct conflict of interest. And this so-called report only highlights the failings. We're calling on the Secretary of State to step in in the interests of the victims and the public purse and propriety and standards of governance to order an immediate forensic accountant and commissioners. What we have seen throughout this module of the at the inquiry is miscreant officers who did not, uh, uh, who, who willfully ignored, obfuscated, councillors who looked the other way, and this can't continue. You, councillors, cannot depend on this report. It's your responsibility, we feel, to take this matter seriously and use your powers to demand an in intervention from the Secretary of St State. Half a billion pounds is a lot of money not to be able to account for. So the questions are, how can this report be considered a full financial summary from June 2017, given there are no details of how many people are being helped, what this help consists of, who's making the decisions, and how the efficacy is measured? There were X number of flats, X number of survivors, X number of ex of, next of kin, X number of wives of bereaved, and X number of community within the area defined by MHCLG as the directly affected community. But no data is provided in this empty rhetorical report at all. Instead, Excuse me, there sorry, are dog whistles. Excuse me, can I just whistles. stop your flow for two seconds? Your five minutes is up. However, can you confirm at the back you are happy for this lady to continue into your time? Yes. Yes? Okay. Then you may carry on. The report talks of the financial costs as being great, but the greater cost is to those who are bereaved and those who survived the tragedy. Yes, of course, that's true, and nothing is good enough for the manslaughter of our kin. However, what is even more painful and offensive is the exploitative commoditization of our grief, our loss, and the profiteering that took place and continues to take place. That is extremely offensive. If support to the tune of nearly half a billion pounds, as reported in the media, has been expended, then where is it? What was it spent on? The cost is to us as the next of kin who lost our children, parents, partners, grandchildren, grandparents and siblings, and the taxpayer who has footed the bill. The winner here was the council, given a blank check with no accountability and almost zero scrutiny to shut down the community. There is no clear tracking of what money this council received from the GLA or from central government. The Secretary of State has confirmed to us 158 million pounds was given to the council to support the victims, but that is not reflected in these figures. Nor the 76 million pounds announced by Theresa May towards housing procurements or the 28 million pounds by Philip Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, in October 2017 budget. These are figures we have had independent confirmation of from central government. There are a lot of generalities and all the encompassing statements regarding mental health, for instance. Bearing in mind there is a separate budget for the NHS, 50 million pounds, there needs to be a clear line-by-line -line breakdown of what these mental health and well-being support for those affected actually means. What was provided to how many? What was the support? What was the measure of delivery, success, or efficacy? There's a great deal of obfuscation and deliberate misleading around the cost of the FFAC and Grenfell United facilities, running costs and staffing costs. Can officers provide clarity in plain English? What has been the cost of the FFAC each floor, the one used by Grenfell United, the staffing costs covered, how many staff and funding for whatever project was provided at this facility and for how much and how many people actually attended and what were the measured outcomes? I could go on, but it, as I don't want to take up the time of my uh, uh, friends and colleagues over there. I think that I will just um, 
probably just provide this in a written form to everyone here, if that's okay, Chairman. Uh, um, absolutely. Everybody has your, your questions down in, in front of them. Yes, I mean, there's, 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 there's issues around, for instance, the HMRC payback from the, from the taxes. Where did that money go? Uh, the, the lack of tracking. It's interesting that only £200,000 has been apportioned for the Independent Task Force, which was really the only independent scrutinising force that there was. The actual complaints procedure is the budget for that is four or five times what was given to the task force. So how do you expect there to be any kind of accountability when you under-resource people and institutions that are there to hold this council to account, particularly during a very chaotic time. And um, it, it, it just goes on and on. And the fact that this council has not, is actually doesn't have fully signed off accounts, audited accounts, the value for money uh, certification has not been issued. And that was precisely the point at which uh, caused the Secretary of State to step in and bring in commissioners for Liverpool City Council, where no one died, but uh, 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 the impropriety was over planning applications, I believe, and some procurements and property deals. So I'm going to put this in writing, and I will forward it to you. And, um, and I really hope that you hear that you cannot depend on these reports that are being provided by your officers. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as I said earlier, everybody has um, these questions in front of them uh, in printed copies. Um, and as I said in my introduction, you, this is the, the start, this is not the finish, this is the first report and we will endeavour to, to go deeper and deeper into this, into the details in order to get transparency for you. Now I'd like to call the next speaker, who is, hold on, now I've lost my sheet, uh, David O'Connell um, and Abbas Dadu, are you just, are you, just you, great, thank you David. Thank you Chair and members of the committee, I'd like to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to be here today. Um, Really, you've said that you think this is the first report into uh, Grenfell spending, but I feel that this is the same report I've been looking at for the last two, at least two years now, the same figures, the same numbers, uh, mixed around in different ways, but still not providing any information. One of the problems I have with the report is it doesn't provide the impact assessments and the targeting of all of these services that have been set up. When the, when the fire happened, there was a panic, and obviously there were panics, and people were just given money. And in the original uh, first few weeks of the fire, I remember there being like a secure call van and 500 pound catches of money were given out to people to provide support to them. So I can understand that there was no real clear accounting at that moment. And then, after they'd given money to people, they then decided to give money to companies to try and support them. So then those kids, a huge amount of strange companies popped up, but they all managed to get their grants because there wasn't really any scrutiny of that either. They just handed the money out to the companies. All of that seemed fair at the time because people were suffering. There was basically a, a total war zone existing in North Kensington around the area of the fire. Uh, people were living in houses that had no facilities. There was no running water. There was no hot water. So I can understand the desire of Gold Command and the Council to step in and support people. But it seems that culture of supporting people, not asking questions, has just carried on and on. And despite last year meeting with Callum, who I see sitting here, and talking about the framework that was being put in place to ensure that these things would be delivered, um, but I'm looking at the same figures. Nothing has changed. The same favoured groups are being given preferential treatment. So really, what I really wanted to know is, in all these figures, in all these tables that I've looked at that have things like support costs, commission support services, they're all very vague generalities. Where is the detailed breakdown of who's getting what for doing what for whom? Because on the ground in Lancaster West, the most affected estate where the tower still stands, we aren't feeling that. And in fact, any of the changes and differences we've, I've seen there in the last two years have been the result of us 
going to government directly and asking for money. The refurbishment of the estate, which isn't in this report, I mean, that's gone from £30 million originally pledged, which would have barely covered changing the windows, to £110 million. But most of that money has not come from the council. And most of that money has come from grants and awards and from working with ministers and the government to try and find a way to deliver what people promised in the few weeks afterwards. So my main import is there is no value for money in this report and the reason your, your assessors cannot sign off the accounts is because you haven't done any impact assessment. And I don't know now how you will be able to do any impact assessment of those first year at least after the fire because no one was keeping track of what was going on. And there was merely a, a, a sort of culture established of favoured groups. I mean, I was told that by Robin Furman herself. They had favoured providers who they basically gave a white blank check to, to and said, OK, you are helping the community, so we'll take your word for it, and here's the money. And I, I would like to hope that this is the start of a change with all of that and that we'll finally get some detailed analysis of what is actually going on. Because I don't think a lot has changed. I don't feel that there's a big difference in the air and that there's new things happening for people and new opportunities. I'd like to hope that that would come to pass, but what's happened in the past has been so misplaced and so misused. The opportunities that they had to give people genuine uh, chances to go to university to help them out. For example, there was a scholarship programme that I worked with, the guy who set that up. He went to Ohio University, got them to give scholarships to pupils off his own back. He's a student there. He actually came over as an immigrant to this country, so he knew what it was like to be uh, an immigrant, to not have the facilities of the state and not to be someone with all that there for them. He ended up in a detention centre, which stopped him going to Goldsmiths, so he ended up at Roehampton. He then got them to give scholarships to people for Grenfell-affected victims. But what happened was those scholarships didn't go to people, everyone in the community who could use them. They went to a chosen few that were selected by one small group. So if things like are going to carry on like that, I don't see how anything will change in North Kensington. Just favouring one small set of people or one group of survivors or anyone else doesn't make a difference to North Kentington itself and it doesn't fix the problems that are in the report. So my other question is also about the properties you bought. So as I see my five minutes is ending, I'll just say the 250 properties, 250 of that 300 properties you bought are not in the HRA. So that means those properties aren't ring-fenced. Now, obviously, no one would expect now that you would evict all the Grenfell survivors who are living in them and tell them that, oh, I'm sorry, we need to sell these because the council needs some more money. But it seemed quite easily from the culture of this council that in 10 years' time, that might not be the case. There might be a different council here. And there's no, been no effort to put it inside a charitable trust or to protect those properties. You've got a, a, a basically a get-out-of-jail-free card with them from the government. At some point in the future, you could just say, oh, I know, uh, there's quite a few of the survivors have died. There's not that many left here. We're going to relocate them from this expensive building and put them in a cheaper one and sell it to make some money for the council. So that is one of the things that caused this in the first place. And I think it's very important that you look at doing something about that because I know what it's like on our estate. Thank you, yeah, I might just yeah, ask you to on wrap our, up. You. Shall I? You can wrap up. Your yeah, I'll wrap up. I just say on our estate... Part of the estate was taken out of the HRA to be baseline business units. But three of those units were supposed to be for social good for the estate, and they were kept in the HRA. But we've never received a penny revenue from them, and we have never received any social good from them or had them used in that way. So I'd just like to say it's very important to remember that there need to be checks and balances with all of this. So you have the rest of my questions. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a chance to speak. Thank you for your time. Um, now I call the next speaker, Caroline Marr, from the Henry Dickens Estate. Hello, I'm a resident of Henry Dickens Court Estate. I've lived there for approximately 28 years. I lived the first four years in Carton House, which is a tower block. And I've lived the rest of the 24 years in Marley House, which overlooks the play area. I'm going to read this out. 
I live in the eighth floor of Marley House. I have lived in this state approximately 28 years. The only funding or programme down in the name of Grenville has been the Latimer Community Arts Therapy, ACA, LCAT services done in Henry Dickens Community Centre. That's in the middle of these two high-rise blocks. It's like the size of a, a bungalow, see. They started using the community centre straight after Grenfell and then, with the funding and the OK from the council, have taken residence there. They have done so in the name of Grenfell and the community. They run mainly activities for children, football, art, cooking and art therapy. The children play outside, directly outside this bungalow and there's a massive play area, which is directly about 10 foot away from my high-rise block. So you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> the children play outside, screaming, playing football loud, and it's just not children from my estate, it's children from other states. They have been lured in by this community centre and the art therapy. The noise is horrendous for me and Marley House and other residents who also work um, two or three different jobs. They might sleep during the day and work all night, but no one's thought about us, no one. My daughter has ADHD, was working studying for her masters. She had a very, very difficult time studying for her masters. This is before lockdown, okay? It wasn't last year, the year before. Uh, and she finished uh, more or less her masters in February of last year, March, just before lockdown. Uh, she had a very difficult time due to the noise. Other residents have felt similar. Residents with bedrooms overlooking the play area fare worse. Others who live in Marley House report children in the, the community centre club purposely aiming balls at their windows, balconies, and generally being rude. I'm keeping rude a lot more than just rude. I and many others have complained about this to them directly, to the council directly, and through council meetings. We were not listened to, often dismissed. This community centre is meant to be shared. It's no longer for all of us on the estate. It seems to be run by a small knit group of friends and family. Since LCAT has been set up in the Henry Dickens Court Community Centre, there has been an atmosphere of intimidation. As I have said, this is the only physical tangible result that I have seen of any of the Grenfell money on my estate. The council was in a very dark, the council was in a very dark time when many traumatised gave a large concentrated amount to a very small group of people who are now telling what we can and cannot do, what we can and cannot say, where we can go and where we can't go. They are regulating the estate. The estate is now worse both physically and mentally speaking due to this, from the behaviour of the staff and the children. The noise, the inaccessibility of the building and the overall atmosphere of intimidation that is now blanketing our estate. I'm going to ask this. Why is all of this money concentrated in this one club? And this one club and this one club give the right to rule all of this estate. There have been no meetings, surveys or studies done in the estate that want what we need and what we think of the LCAT set up in our community centre, and yet they seem to have forgotten an enormous amount of funding from council. I uh, seem to have gotten an enormous amount of funding from council as well as special privileges. Now, there's been no no one's ever come round my block and asked exactly how we are affected by this. No one has been to see us. You have no idea what this club has done to us. And most people living in the block thought it, was, thought it was a good idea, but for one or two years, now it's like a school in the middle of these two blocks and a confined area with the sound echoes. We have Avondale School to the side. Why did you not find something being done in there? It's, I can't. The council has spent half a... I don't... spent an enormous amount of money since Grenfell on the community and victims, but as I've said, I've seen no tangible results. So how is this expenditure being measured? How are KNC measuring up if the money that they are spending is useful or beneficial? No one's asked. No one's bothered to ask the residents of Henry Dickens School if it's beneficial for them. But you've managed to fund this money to bring other kids from other areas into our estate. It's bloody hell. 
I can't. Uh, let me go to three because I can't even go. Mm. Okay. By the, all of the money considered in this one club, and the one club in this club given the right to rule all of the state, there have been no meetings after I did that. Uh, and I'd like to know why isn't there more information about how this club, this organisation, managed to set up there and expand and expand. I want to know how they were given this money, who decided the amount of money they've got. And most of the state would like to know that, and especially Marley House. You have no idea what you have done. I know you have done it probably rushed, but you have not thought about Marley House at all or the Henry Dickens Court Estate. It's a bloody nightmare. I've been there 28 years and I've never had to come to a council meeting. But this is it. If it means war, I'm going to war on this bloody thing because we've had enough. And a lot of the, a lot of the older residents like, I don't want to do it, Caroline. I'm too frightened. I don't want to say anything. And as I've not been brought up in that area, I don't care who you're related to. I'm not intimidated by anyone, but I'm not putting up with any more of this. Sorry, thanks. Thank you thanks very for much, listening to me. Caroline, for thanks. taking time to come and speak to us about this. Thank you. Sorry, I went over. But I'm not used to this. It's not That's the right, kind of thing yeah. I usually do. Did very well. Thank you. Um, well, thank you again to the speakers for for coming in and talking to us. Um, I know five minutes is not a massive amount of time, but but um, we're delighted to give you the opportunity and hope we will endeavour to get to the bottom of your inquiries. What I'm proposing to do next is to let the officers respond to specific questions where they can verbally um, and obviously as I said at the beginning we will get a written response to everything um, published. So officers who would like to kick off before we go into the committee members questions? Thank you. Karen, so thank if you. I could just pick up a couple of specifics and I'll pass over to some colleagues. If I could pick up on a reference to the government grant, which I think has been picked up um, by the first speaker. So in relation to question, I think it was question two. So we do have a line. Can you hear me now? That's better. Yep. Okay, so yeah, just in reference to uh, the question around the government grant, which I'd like to mm -hmm. just answer now, but we'll also put it in writing as well. So we do have a line-by-line -line breakdown um, of each of the grants that we've, got, we've received. Unfortunately, we don't recognise the 76 million, so we're happy to have a conversation after in relation to that. So the 28 million was announced as part of the original um, uh, the government grant that was announced and what we've done is we've compared obviously we've, we've ba been made aware of the uh, list of government grants that has been shared and we've compared the two against our records and I can confirm that we can fully uh, explain all of the grants that we received and it does align with what government have suggested as well. There is a difference between the figures that have been quoted, so the 158 million that was quoted earlier today. That does include two items. It includes um, 32.3 million towards um, Kensington and Chelsea College, and also uh, 1.9 million towards um, paid to other, other organisations, not to the council. So the reference to the 105 million within the report that we've got here does exclude the funding that we've got for Lancaster West, but I can touch on that briefly. But um, that is in terms of the money that the Council has received to date, which equates to the 105 million. So, so just, sorry to stop you, just tying yeah. it into the report for everybody's sake, um, we're looking at page three, correct? In terms of trying to get clarity on, on, on where the numbers are tie in here. So it'd be paragraph 2.2, which is referenced in the report and in response to yep. question two that was raised by the first speaker about the discrepancy in the government, uh, government grant. So we'll put that fully in writing. Okay. But I can confirm that obviously we can fully explain obviously the grant that we've received and obviously what's been provided separately to the speaker, uh, first speaker. The difference is because it includes items that 
didn't necessarily, it didn't come to the council, they were passed straight other to other organisations and therefore wouldn't be uh, figures that we would include in our numbers. Right. So that's the difference. Understood. Yeah. So the, sorry, the, the other question, obviously, the reference to the uh, refund from the council from HMRC for the VAT. Um, no, it, it, this hasn't gone into the recovery budget, so this has been returned to council resources. Um, so funding has already been set aside, a separate ring fence, 50 million for the recovery strategy. So I can confirm that that uh, refund of 5.3 isn't contributing towards the funding of the recovery strategy at this stage. Um, just a couple of others that I can respond to today. If I could just come back on the 250 properties, um, which was a question actually that was raised by a couple of a couple of the speakers today. Um, so, uh, I should start. Sorry, apologies. So, um, in terms of the 250 properties, so. Um, there are, some, there are some properties that are held for social rent. Um, so normally these would be held within the um, housing revenue count, which was picked up uh, today. Obviously, at the time of the tragedy, the uh, housing revenue account was facing particular financial challenges, and therefore special dispensation was seeked by government to be able to hold those properties within the general fund. Now, I can confirm that that is a purely accounting um, issue. There is there's no impact on residents, no impact on tenures or security of tenures um, for the individual residents. It's an accounting uh, purpose. Social rent properties are, would normally be held within the HRA. So at the time of writing this report, they are still held within the general fund. We will, at a point in time, reconsider whether the uh, transferring into the housing revenue account is the uh, is the best approach, but we need to do that in a time when the housing revenue account is financially viable. So what we wouldn't want to do is jeopardise the financial viability of the housing revenue account. So they are at this stage held in the general fund, however there is no impact on uh, people that hold those properties. And, and just to pick up on that, do you have any expectations of when we may look at transferring that? Um, there, are no, there are no specific time scales as yet. It's been discussed by officers. Like I say, it's very much around the financial viability of the HRA to be able to take that transfer of those, of those homes um, and, and identify the right time. So it's definitely a live discussion that's happening at the moment. So it's normal practice that social homes will be held in the HRA. So we want to explore that, but at the right time when it's financially viable. Okay, so, so we can say on the record here that it's very much our intention to transfer it into the HRA? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if I could just uh, come back on a couple of others, that, and then I'll pass over to colleagues. Um, so apologies. Um, so... Uh, so there was, a, there was a reference to underspends within the 50 million recovery. So the 50 million recovery is a ring fence budget. So when we agreed this, this, the five-year strategy, we agreed 50 million that was ring fenced. Now, obviously, Callum will touch on some of the detail if he, he prefers to, but certainly at the end of year, each year, there is some underspends that come through. Now, obviously, our commitment is that that is still ring fenced towards the 50 million, and therefore it gets transferred into the reserve. In terms of that decision and who that sits with, that is typically a decision that's taken by finance. It's in, normal, it's in line with normal practice, and it's what we would do with any other ring fenced uh, fund. So it's not treated any differently. So in terms of the decision making, that's typically a finance decision in consultation with the service. But it's absolutely in line with the normal practice that we would undertake. Um, do you want? Sorry, I think that was all. Callum, Callum, can I pass over to you? Yeah, yeah or to David? If I could, Chair, pick up on a couple of points. One that yep. the first speaker mentioned around um, the audit of the accounts and the, yep. the, the status of the accounts. So, 
I know the committee are, are, are well aware that the actual accounts themselves up to 2019-20 have been signed off with an unqualified opinion, but the value for money conclusion which sits alongside the accounts has not yet been signed off since the accounts for 2017-18, which our previous external auditor KPMG were not able to sign off at that point, which means that our current auditors can't sign off the, the, the following year's value for money conclusions. Now, they've all done the work they need to do for each of those years. That the, the factor, which again was made clear by KPMG first and then Grant Thornton, is that whilst the public inquiry and the Metropolitan Police investigation are running, the impacts on the council and the council's finances are, are fundamentally unknown and the extent to which the findings of the, the inquiry and the police investigation will impact on that. And it's that particular aspect which means that the value for, mon value for money conclusion itself can't be signed off. Yes, so, work, so just to yeah. confirm, the value for money cannot be signed off by the previous auditor and consequently our current auditors until there is conclusion on the Grenfell inquiry and the investi police investigation. That's correct. That's what's been reported to the committee on yep. several occasions. Yep. So I want to make that clear so the committee, I'm sure, okay. were well aware of that. The other aspect I wanted to pick up on, which was in the detailed questions we, we, we received kindly before um, the meeting today, <coughs> was around fraud cases. So we have reported on the outcome of fraud cases and prosecutions to the committee before, um, but not on recovery. So in terms of recovery of funds, so to date there have been um, 20 successful prosecutions none of whom actually were people who actually had any relationship or connection to the tower. So I have to be very clear about that. This was people from you know, outside the area who were, who were um, committing fraud against the council and actually against those who were affected by the tragedy. Um, it, the P Metropolitan Police handled all of those prosecutions and the recovery of funds. To date, they've recovered just under £21,000 of funds um, from the total fraud committed. Uh, that's been returned to us and returned to, to provide um, for services through the Grenfell support budgets. Um, we are still awaiting the outcome and with the delays due to COVID through the courts of a number of cases and the police will assess on a case by case basis whether individuals have assets against which to recover, uh, which has been, been the difficulty with most of the cases that have gone through the courts already to see where they can recover further funds on behalf of the council. So I, I mean, I'm slightly reluctant to get into a sort of dialogue. What I'm trying to do is, is, is go through as many questions as possible and, and clarifying them. I'm not clarifying them for myself, per se, but ju just for the sort of record, if, if we may continue like that. Hold on. Uh, my, my vice chair has overruled me, and if it's a quick question, we'll allow you to speak. Right. And police investigation. Do you realise that is an open-ended? It does have. It has no end. If you look at other tragedies like this, some of them have taken 20, 30, 40 years. So effectively, this council. Is not have, is, is, is put itself in a position of not having a proper audit for the foreseeable future, not only since 2017, but going forward. This cannot be sustainable. It's not tenable. You can't have a blank check. Thank you, Kimmy. Um, Mike, I think it's, it's time for you to comment on that. I mean, the decision on that is is up to, to the decision on that is up to our external auditors, and in fact, it's really up to the the origin, the auditors at the time because um, Grant Thornton can't do it until KPMG have made their decision. They they are exploring whether they can do it without um, waiting for the outcome of the inquiry, but it's very difficult for them to do that because they they need to. That what they don't want to do is to have to do a, a sort of inquiry themselves to, to step on the purview of the inquiry. So um, it's really a matter for them, not for us. We can, um, we, it's up to KPMG really. So that's the, that's the position with it. The rest of the audit is all done. It is the value for money conclusion that's been left. But the accounts for every year have been completed apart from that. 
Thank you, Mike. If I just may take a comment from Gazette, a question from Gazette. May I ask a clarifying question, which may or may not be helpful, which is there is a distinction to be made between value for money as part of an audit in general. It's not to, so we're not suggesting in the slightest that external auditors have not been through our accounts. They have, and they have audited them without qualification. So I think it might be helpful to clarify the portion of the value for money decision specifically and how that impacts the whole. Yeah, they, they've validated the, the, all the accounts. They've gone through and given us an unqualified opinion on the accounts, and that's correct. It's just the, the, the narrow value for money decision that hasn't been, they haven't been able to do because they couldn't do it in that original year, because they were unable to say whether the council um, provided value for money given what, obviously, the tragedy that happened. Yeah. Can I say? Yeah. Yes. I, I can recall uh, uh, the early meetings that we had with KPMG, and essentially the value for money element was on the partnering arrangements. So there's various sub elements within where they're making judgments on value for money, and their concern was about the partnering rate, and essentially between the council and the TMO. And that was the issue. That was the issue they raised with me in the first meeting. I don't know what they said subsequently, Mike. Uh, it may have been they, uh, they, they uh, drew that out. But actually, the original was the element about uh, partnership arrangements that's in the value for money consideration. And that classically is supplier management or where you've got a large contractor. And they felt that this was under a public inquiry and that they didn't want to make a judgment on that and then subsequently uh, they they're not out there was a re, uh, change we didn't change uh, they changed they withdrew from the market and we're now with another auditor so it's it's a deep frustration to us I have to say to the organization that we're in this position we would like very much to be out of it uh, but we as Mike said that they are uh, having discussions about is there a way they can do this without having to wait for the inquiry because as um, uh, has been said this this could be hanging for many many years and this is unsatisfactory uh, and if I may just uh, reassure you um, that I have the privilege of signing the accounts um, and this conversation happens every single year and and in multiple points during the year with the auditors regarding this and with the officers. So it's, it's, this is not new to us by any stretch. I think if we could move on to the next question. Sorry, David, did you want to say anything? No. no? Callum, you're up. Thank you, Chair. So, and thank you to all of the different speakers who came and raised their questions. Um, I know that there's a number of them that would normally fall within my remit, um, and as, as you rightly set out, we will respond to all of them in writing. Um, I will try and uh, group them where I can um, for a few minutes now, if that's helpful. Um, I think the first theme of questions that I heard from Kimio and have read have been about questions about the FFAC, the Friends and Family Assistance Centre, and uh, the Grenfell United space. Um, and I know there are a few different questions highlighted in the, in the set of questions that we had. Uh, I think it's firstly helpful to set out that there are key decision reports dated from 2017, uh, where the leadership team agreed both the leases for both two floors and the uh, building management arrangements. Um, and they have always been public and, and the figures associated with both the cost of the lease and the costs of running the space have, have been public since then. Um, in terms of the background to this, it might be quite helpful. So um, there were two separate requests. So the Family and Friends Assistance Centre was initially based in a, a legal building over in Chancery Lane and many bereaved families were having to tra travel across London into an environment they didn't feel comfortable with, and they, we were asked to identify a building locally in the area. 
We worked with a, uh, this is set out in the leadership re team report, we worked with a number of uh, bereaved families to try and identify buildings. We looked at a number of different buildings to try and find a space and eventually settled upon uh, Old Court Place um, and took a lease uh, that lasts until uh, June next year. The Grenfell United uh, conversation is different. Um, uh, I think through conversations, as I understand it, that they were having with central government, Theresa May, the Prime Minister at the time, asked the Council to locate and, and find a space for Grenfell United, um, uh, which, we, which we duly did, and we identified the fact that the, the building that we took, um, they, it, eventually it worked out for them to take the sixth floor of the building of Old Court Place and for the Family and Friends Assistance Centre to be based on the fifth. So, so that, that's the history. Um, for clarity on funding, the government, because of the uniqueness of both spaces, so I should say the FFAC at the beginning of time was a place where uh, the council didn't really have a presence. It was a place where brief families would meet with their lawyers, with the police, with the family liaison officers and have incredibly difficult and emotional conversations. Um, and uh, therefore, it, it was something that the government gave us a grant to deliver. So we received a grant to run both spaces uh, uh, for, for both different initiatives. And uh, that, that grant has paid for the Grenfell United space ever since 2017 right through until today. So the council has never paid for the Grenfell United space and it has never come out of the £50 million. The government grant covered the costs of the FFAC for uh, the first two years, up until the point when we uh, agreed and launched the uh, Grenfell recovery strategy. And since then, the costs associated with the fifth floor have been met by the dedicated service budget. So they have formed part of the £4.5 million budget that constitutes the, the that we have for the dedicated service. Um, I, I think I would acknowledge that there has been some confusion at points because of the two floors are in the set, the two buildings are in the same uh, place, and also um, we ended up using the same organisation, Action for Children, to manage both floors. Um, uh, but the funding revenues have always been separate for that reason. So uh, uh, we can provide more detail in writing, but I hope that's helpful on, on that initial point. Um, another. Uh, key point that was raised uh, by Kimia, you can just find it, was around um, the 50 million itself and as, as my colleague Taryn pointed to, the use of the underspends. So I think it's really important that we're clear that the 50 million that pays for Grenfell recovery isn't government money, it's not GLA money, it's council money, it's council reserves and we've always been very clear on that and I think it's important to be clear on that because I know that there is often misunderstanding around uh, the source of the money and as uh, Taryn says, when, uh, when the money isn't spent it's held in a reserve, specifically for the dedicated service, uh, we, are, we have at points um, held money in the reserve. That is most often the case because uh, of the pace at which bereaving survivors are choosing to access different forms of support. So we have uh, a specific uh, function of an individual services provision uh, and when people don't choose to use their uh, allocated budget, that money doesn't disappear. Rightly, it rolls on for them to be able to use in future years and therefore we do uh, often have money that is allocated for a particular year that, that transfers over. Um, in, in the, given we're here at the Audit and Transparency Committee, we'd be happy to provide more detail on the reserve and show how those different funding pots um, are held and how they're not used for anything else. Um, the next point is around engagement and uh, satisfaction. Uh, which is pointed to at point 19 about the dedicated service, and I, um, you know, here, here I would note that you know we, we always acknowledge that the dedicated service provides support to 700 survivors and bereaved, and uh, I work hard and my team works hard to deliver support that is appropriate and right for all of those different people. But we completely acknowledge that there are times when. Um, perhaps the support we're providing isn't quite right for someone, and so there is always room for improvement. But that said, the satisfaction and the engagement levels we have are, are high, 
They are not based upon some of the uh, mechanisms that are discussed here. We use uh, quality assurance mechanisms. We do, our own, we do audits. We do feedback. We do proven survivors mark their own progress depending on their recovery. And uh, engagement is, is mapped by numbers of support plans that are completed, levels, levels of engagement based on a weekly and daily basis. So we have a, a suite of information that, um, that stands to that. Really importantly, at, at, at point 19, I'd also just like to just to make a note about the steering group. So at, at, at question 19 in the paper, uh, there is a seemingly an assertion that the steering group is um, is not fit for purpose. It, it would be my polite way of uh, summarising what's written. Um, and I, I, I think we have to be very careful there. Um, the steering group is formed of bereaved and survivors who choose to come to support the ongoing delivery of the service and everyone was written to, all breeding survivors were written to, to be able to come forward and be part of the steering group. We've done that twice. And actually the, the individuals all work within assigned terms of reference and code of conduct. So it is, it's, it's incorrect to say that they aren't regulated or managed in terms of how they work, how they work and what they do. And very importantly, that their names and the minutes of every single meeting is available on the dedicated service website, which is only available to breathing survivors. The reason for that is we have heard loud and clear the points around privacy and breathing survivors being keen to ensure that we aren't necessarily advertising or promoting on behalf of the council, which mm -hmm. I could understand some of the speakers were suggesting, um, uh, and instead are delivering support that they need in, in a more private setting. Um, if I can, uh, I'd move on to uh, the second speaker's suggestions, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Um, and that's so David, and uh, I guess there was, a, again, we'll, we'll answer all of the four uh, written questions in detail. Um, you know, and I, I think that here there's a couple points to raise. Um, we are working hard on increasing uh, the availability of data on impact. And indeed, uh, this year we are going to be later in the autumn publishing our first impact report. I, I would acknowledge, you know, perhaps, perhaps that's something that we could have done earlier. Perhaps we could have had an impact report in earlier years. Um, but, but where we are now, we committed to doing that in the resourcing framework that was agreed by the leadership team in December. And we are working hard to deliver upon that. And I would hope that the production of that impact report would address some of the queries and concerns that David has raised. It, in terms of the financial details, we have, through conversations with David and other community partners, provided a much more detailed uh, um, breakdown on uh, 2021 spend, which is on the Council website. And as David is aware, we are working on doing the same for 1920, which includes financial information and performance metrics. So again, I hope, I hope that will go some way to addressing the, the concerns. Uh, and finally, um, to Caroline's point, uh, you know, I, I think we'll definitely take some actions away to speak with housing management and make sure we're, we're looking at this collectively because it, it, it was uh, sad to hear her experience. Um, and also... Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, if you could just allow Callum to finish and then... Uh, and also, I think that there's definitely work for us to do to make sure that residents of the Henry Dickens estate, including Caroline, are, are more aware of some of the support that is available through the community, for the support for the wider community. So we have the Grenfell Projects Funds, we have the Community Leadership Programme launching soon, we'll have the Housing Legacy Fund. So there are a number of initiatives that are for people like Caroline, and um, it's, a, it's a task that we must take to ensure that people, to people know that and can access the support. And uh, if we were to have somebody from the council have a proper meeting with Caroline, who, who, who would, just uh, if you forgive me, um, who would that person be and who, what can we commit to for Caroline? Um, it, it's probably a mixture of officers working on the Grenfell response and housing management colleagues. And I think that's the right thing to do would be to have a, a joint conversation. Okay. So I, can, I can take that and, away. And you're going to, can I get a commitment for you to facilitate that? Of course. By the end of next week? By the end of, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, we're yeah. only on Tuesday today, aren't we? Yep. Okay. Can I, I'm going to give you a brief minute, but, uh, but, uh, but I must stress, Caroline, we haven't got into our, our members as yet. Okay, one minute. 
phoned up the council to complain about this from day dot. This has been going on for years. Do you know what I was told? We can't tell, tell people how to bring up their children. You go and tell them, tell them what to do. Are you kidding me? You play as they're against right. each other. Cara, Every time we, I now, we now have a commitment time, on record. The amount of times, the amount of people who have said, you have said, says, well, no one else has complained. We are now getting together in Marley House. You have did nothing. You should never, ever have sat a school in the middle of these two buildings, because that's what it's become. And a sports centre come playground. It's ridiculous. You never gave a damn about us. And how can one organisation get over a million pounds? I don't know. I'm sorry, but I'm not okay. listening to this. You're never going Thank to do you. it. I don't believe you'll do it. Okay, just to reiterate, we have a commitment um, from Callum, and this committee will be keeping a careful eye on it. Oh, hold on, hold on. So, we, we, I'm, I'm afraid we really have to press on. Um, so, where, where, sorry, I'm, sorry, madam, I have given you the opportunity to speak. Okay. Um, thank you very much, officers, for your responses. I'm just wondering how this is going to work as a committee. We have meetings at the end of June, meetings at the end of July, and then September. Um, a lot of information is going to come to us from your answers to the questions in here. Um, what sort of time frame are we going to get those answers in? Um, so, so certainly within, I mean, so a lot of the answers are there already, so we've kind of given some updates at the meeting here, but I would say I'm looking at looking at my colleagues um, saying kind of within two weeks, Perfect. would that be okay. reasonable? Okay, that is great. So yeah. when, when, they're, when your answers are released, can you send them to the committee, and I will have an agenda item on our next meeting to discuss this. David? So, Taryn, if you send them halfway through the cycle, can we send our comments back and you update on our comments for the actual next meeting so that we're not, it's not just your comments, but it's your comments on our comments that you've given. And that would actually, that could cut out quite a lot of um, wastage. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy and I'm looking at a colleague, so we, we, could, we can do that. So if your next meeting is the end of June, then June, you can, yeah, you can bring those in and have a look at the, the final draft, obviously, at this meeting. So that's, that's fine. Could, could I? Oh, yep. yep. Can I, can I just, sorry, just add one, one point, one thing that I didn't necessarily cover under the grants, and apologies, I, I've kind of overlooked something that was raised um, uh, as part of the first speakers around, obviously we've talked quite extensively about government grant, but I didn't necessarily touch on the GLA, the money that the council has received from the GLA, and I know that that was a particular question that was raised and we can answer today. So just, just to confirm, so the GLA, the money that the council has received from the GLA equates to 10.8 million. So that's it, that we received that money, um, a contribution of 60,000 for every property that we acquired for those that needed rehome. So apologies, I, I meant to give that in terms of my update. And I suppose just to give the, the rest of the committee a little bit of assurance, and I should have said it before, is that any grant that we get, whether it's from the GLA or the government, that it's paid retrospectively. So the government, uh, so the council has to provide all the necessary evidence and working paper of spend before any of that grant money is released. So it, it, not only evidence, but it's also audited by both government and the GLA where relevant before that's passed over. So I think that's particularly okay. something that I want to obviously explain to the committee. So apologies, Chair, I should have raised that when I did the update because I know government grants have been quite a topical question over the last couple of days. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Taryn. Um, so we know what we're going to do in answering the questions. We know the committee is going to be involved in the answers to those questions. Um, now it's time for questions from the committee members. I mean, you know, as we suspected, this meeting is way too short. Uh, but it is what we've been given. And we do have one, two, three, four more meetings this year. Um, so we do have time to continue this, as I said. Um, so what I'd like you as, as members to think about is the sort of specific questions 
and what areas you want to sort of delve into and specifically want a bit more information on. Um, one of the questions that came to me from uh, David, our Vice Chairman, was specifically on the, the spreadsheet breakdown accountancy format of, so you can see everything. Um, and thank you for the officers for, for getting that prepared so quickly. And I'm going to now pass on to first point from David in terms of the questions from the committee. This is not so much a request for information now, but in terms of what I would like. I would like to see a total for income and a total for expenditure, and capital is different, year by year, and then on subsequent tabs behind it, the breakdown going into more detail, as you can see on table one, and then you get more details on table three and table four, and then on table four, dedicated service, what is the breakdown of the top line 3.8 million? And that, that would have its own separate tab on the spreadsheet. And then maybe with the really large ones, you'd have, if there are half a dozen separate constituent elements of that, you'd have, the, you'd have an explanation for each of the large items. I'd like to have cash flow and movement on reserves. And I say that because just to make a, um, an observation, at the bottom of page 4.7, it says in the first year of the recovery strategy, spend was 12.016 million, higher than the budget of 12 million. Well, it was negligibly higher. It was 0.13% higher. Contrast that with the reserves or the use of reserves on table four, contribution to reserves from dedicated service to fund, to fund future support for one, two, three, four, five. Of the 12 million expenditure in 2021, 1.4 was reserves. That's about 12%. That is an order of magnitude different to the 0.13% on the previous page. Equally, for income, where have we got, how, what has, how have we funded all the different expenditure, both capital and uh, revenue? How much has been from, rev from government and what sort of government expenditure has it been? Has it been a grant? Has it been a, and not, it, is, it isn't really, but a gift or what? So that we've got, um, we can trace what has come in and when and what has funded what. And um, this may be going too far. I would be interested to know for the uh, 235 million spent on housing, where all the houses are. I'm not expecting the address because that is far too detailed. But lower super output areas, that might be an acceptable way of indicating where they are. Um, it might or might not be acceptable to say the size and the cost so that we know exactly what we're getting for 235 million, which is a pretty big chunk of the balance sheet. Um, we could probably put the updated valuations on them as well. Yeah. If we have that to hand. That, um, but I'm, if you produce a first draft, Taryn, I'm very happy to go through it and then give my feedback on a Zoom meeting or Teams or whatever, or come in and see you so that we can make sure that there is something that makes sense to everyone. Could I just, can I just, um, obviously I won't come in with, with the detailed information today, but just to give you um, just the, on a bit of assurance, so obviously some of that information or most of it is in the report, but I think we'll pull that together and obviously drill down into a little bit more detail. Obviously we do need to recognize the privacy uh, kind of issue that obviously uh, Callum's raised earlier today, but absolutely, let's see what we can do in terms of pulling that detail. We do have that information. We've got line by line spend. And just on the capital, just again to give you that assurance that we've got a line by line breakdown of all those properties, uh, the 292 that obviously we purchased and referred to in the report. So yes, obviously we won't, can't give you the address, but we can at least look at a, a kind of a smaller geography. So it gives you an idea of where in the borough 
and in some cases maybe outside of the borough. So we did make a commitment at the time that we would purchase either within the borough or on the kind of very kind of neighbouring areas. But we do know that there were some individuals that obviously wanted to move out of the borough. So we can certainly give you that information. And we've got all of that. We've done quite a detailed exercise actually as part of the work around the 250 that um, and potentially transferring into the HOA. So absolutely. So if I pull together what I think you need, and then we can, yeah. Take what, I, I just listening to this, point. what strikes me is, is this is going to be ferociously difficult for Esme, who is watching this, taking notes on YouTube. So Esme, if you're listening, um, please liaise with David and Taryn. Be on that email loop and ensure that y y we get clarity on what exactly is requested, and then everybody is happy, and then it goes out to committee. So to be clear, I just don't think that paragraph 2.2, from June 2017 to the 31st of March 2021, the council has spent, I'm not sure I like that word, a gross aggregate of 4.05.8 million on its response and recovery efforts. And then it says this 4.405.8 million is a combination of revenue and capital expenditure. I think that's quite confusing. We spent 100 million on expenditure, revenue expenditure, and 250 million or whatever it is on capital. And people will get confused because they will say that you've got nothing to show for, the, for a half a billion. Actually, buying large numbers of houses and investing in that is something that will last for generations, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Barry. That's okay. Um, Go ahead. I just wanted to say several times the figure of half a billion. You just used the figure half a billion. This comes from The Guardian, and The Guardian basically added together our report and the figure from the public inquiry, which was about 117 million. Um, which is why they said it's over 500. They, they added the public inquiry to a cost in this report. So the figures in this report were 406, and the headline is that the council spent 290, the government spent 105, and the GLA 11. That's the overall. Now, the point that you're making is absolutely sound, which is when we're doing it on capital, of course, that's... Uh, an asset that will rise, and it's very fundamentally different from expenditure on revenue. But the overall position is that three to one to, sorry, essentially 30 to 10 to one ratio between us, the, the government, and the GLA. And if that could be very clearly in the next, one of the next paragraphs in the next edition, that would be a very helpful start so that a lazy journalist can cut and paste it. <laughs> thank you. Andrew. Can, can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I think the first thing I want to say is that, uh, I'll say the obvious, this is a very big, very complex issue, um, and this is the first time this committee has had any chance, really, to spend um, a, a serious amount of time on it. Um, I could make say many things, but I'd like to start with that I think we as a committee um, uh, have one as one of our tenants to find assurance um, that things are being done properly within the council. Um, and I think I'd like to start with a better understanding of what is being done by the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Now, I know you drew, drew our attention to, uh, our attention was drew, drawn to paragraphs 2.4, 2.5 of the role different roles of the, the two committees, this committee and the overview and um, scrutiny committee. I'd like to get much more under the skin of that, and I'd like you to consider whether there could be, to a degree, some joint investigation, joint working with that committee, because I think it's really difficult for us, particularly the co-opted members, to make informed comment without a, a broader knowledge as to what's going on in that other committee, uh, to fill um, our objective of, of, of assurance. I think the second thing is it's really good for the committee to be able to hear sort of from people um, who have been directly affected by, by Grenville. Um, and I'm struck that there are a number of concerns. Um, 
um, and they, they are, are strongly felt concerns. I know we're going to respond to them, um, but um, it's made me think that what is lacking from the report in front of us is um, uh, data that um, uh, relates better to how we spent money that affect the people concerned or the, the, the people who have been affected. So um, I've got a background of a lot of governance work in the NHS where everything is patient centric. I'd like to have management information and reports which really start from the position of what's happened into the um, Grenville people rather than a report which starts from the accounting classifications that we typically use uh, in, in the council's accounts. Um, and, and one particular thing that I'd like to see, subject to uh, being told that the Overview and Scrutiny Committee have already seen it, is we had an amount of money, we allocated those resources, we decided to do certain things, and I'd like to look post facto to see how the money was spent compared with how we expected to spend it, and then how, um, how well the needs of the people from Grenfell um, were met, or those affected by Grenfell were met or not. And then, taking this full circle, um, there are inevitably lessons that we will have learned through the way we approach dealing with these issues. And I'd like to know a bit more how we are recycling those back into what we can do with the future. So um, I'm all for um, looking backwards, uh, but I think looking backwards should inform us how we can um, better improve uh, or, or improve uh, going forwards. So that's the second point I'd make. Uh, third point, I noticed that um, towards the end of the report we talk about the dedicated service, and I think that's where really our interest was taken by some I think it was uh, Councillor Dent's comments about the dedicated service, which perhaps uh, were a catalyst for this. Um, I'd like to see a lot more granular information on an activity basis, um, which does actually centre on um, uh, the, the, the people affected by Grenville. And the last point I'd make is that I would like to see um, a full um, discussion as to whether we need to engage people from outside the organisation to do a fully independent review and to look at the um, costs and the benefits, pluses and minuses of going along that road. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be solely at this committee's um, uh, discretion to say whether we should do that or not, but I think that needs to be explored a lot more fully than I'm aware that it has been. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid uh, I did request governors to send out the OSC reports to everybody as well as this report, um, but I have, we have the report here um, and we'll make sure that, that you get them and I think really we should get the next few coming through where, there's, where there are overlaps um, because you're right, you, we can't just look at this in, in isolation. Um, if you haven't got an early train back, you can stay for the next three-hour slot. Um, sorry, Callum. Yep. Thanks, Chair. And, and uh, thank you, Mr. Ling. Um, I think one thing perhaps we could definitely do, I, I, hear, I hear your desire for a more detailed uh, look at the dedicated service, and, and indeed we'd welcome that. And um, perhaps two, two things that we could really bring to that conversation. One is we have a delivery assurance board um, that reviews and o oversees the whole of the Grenfell Recovery Program that spans not just the support to grieving survivors, but all of the different initiatives that are outlined here. And uh, we could share that with you and the committee to be able to see the more granular deliverables, but also the KPIs and all of the other metrics that we, we hold. Um, and indeed, that will eventually form uh, the, the, the central sort of pillar of the impact report that we've been discussing. And alongside that, we, ha we hold um, with the steering group that was discussed earlier, management, a sort of DS management pack. Um, and that's another thing we could share with you, which looks at all of the different engagement rates, performance metrics, where people are progressing and where they're not. And I think it will uh, provide you with some of the 
granular, more qualitative information that, it, that I, I, I feel I, you're requesting. So can we have that included on our next um, pack for the 20th of June, our next audit yep. transparency committee meeting? Yeah. And just quickly, before just to comment on Andrew's thoughts on the independent report or external independent whether it's external or internal could we just get Barry to comment on that as to whether we can make yes. a decision or your view on it um, may I just say that I chair the corporate delivery assurance board and we, we, we meet every uh, six weeks I think um, um, and have done for the three years um, uh, I do think we can provide you with much more information about which gives service-based assurance. Um, it's not patient-centric in the way that you describe. So, um, and that's because uh, um, there's so much which is contested person to person um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, uh, but I think the point I would say is that. Uh, the, well, normally when there's an enormous incident, say for example a, a patient death or a child death, um, each organisation does independent management reviews to learn what it did from the past and then they get together and do an overall review. We haven't been able to do that because of the existence of the public inquiry and because of the uh, corporate manslaughter case. We have to um, open ourselves to the inquiry itself. And so I am, I'm very conscious that there's a module in the inquiry which will be looking into the aftermath and what happened in the aftermath, media aftermath. And what we must do is um, uh, reveal, reveal, disclose the complete truth about the organization's uh, um, response to that. And that what we, although we have a strong uh, Grenfell lessons learned uh, theme to our management, and organizational changes, we haven't put those into one document. We haven't looked back and said, these were the errors that were made for these reasons at these times, because this is itself, we can't do is to preempt or compromise the evidence that's given in an inquiry where we, as we have agreed with the, I think we're the only authority in the country that's done this, we've, we've signed the Hillsborough Charter that says the interests of those who are bereaved um, are actually above our interests as an institution, as a public institution, and therefore we will disclose everything and be candid about everything. Um, and the, the inquiry itself examines the details of what we've done, not us. So that's why I think that there's a, I've sort of found this a quite a, a difficult thing for the organization because we're literally going into an inquiry and I'm, I watch and listen to what people are saying. I, as the manager, the chief executive, we have been, not been able to do this before. And that is, I think that, that is a unique thing for an organization. And it's unique because I think we're the only um, authority that, as you heard from the first speaker, uh, it's felt, uh, I won't repeat the, the phrase that was used, but we're the only authority that's ever been charged with solving the problem that the people who suffer the problem believe that we were major contributors to causing in the first place. And that is the loop, the paradox that we can't really, uh, we, we have to accept, you know, that these are views of some people uh, and of many people. But um, we were, uh, that decision was made uh, by government um, in July and August um, uh, 2017, the, the initial pattern of expenditure uh, that we're reporting on here was actually agreed by London Gold. So whether that was the humanitarian work or the other work, that pattern was agreed by London Gold according to a national disaster recovery, and we really didn't take responsibility for about four months. And then an awful lot of our expenditure was really not just the response and the recovery, but also the accountability to government on a daily basis, literally a daily basis, to ministers and secretaries of state, not one, ten. So uh, an awful lot of this is uh, we mustn't, as an organisation, overmanage what we're 
the information that's been um, put before the inquiry by its examiners who are examining our records, literally all of our emails, all of our discussions in the past. And I think it's important we don't compromise that. Thank you, Barry. Um, Liz, can I? Okay. Uh, take yes. Your thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Been waiting a long time. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah. The, I mean, this is this is this is it's a very difficult issue, and we presented with a report which is only looking at ex expenditure in reality, um, but it's obviously had a massive impact on the lives of many. But I found it very difficult looking at the report. I just support completely what David and Andrew have said. Uh, to get um, a sense of the proportionality of the expenditure, you know, how many people, how many people were rehoused, and, and more detail on that in the analysis, I think, would, would help to sort of, uh, you know, um, be able to judge the expenditure that's been uh, spent. Um, and the other thing I noticed was that, um, yeah, there was an underspend on um, the uh, 2021 financial year. Um, of 2.4 million, of which 1.4 was taken out of table four, uh, but the rest was sent to put to reserves. But we don't seem to have analysis of the reserves. Um, so that, that may be helpful. Which brings me on to my last point, which is um, this all runs to 2024. What happens then? Uh, we will we will be reviewing this in the next uh, period. Um, the uh, the recovery strategy, the resourcing framework, takes us to 2024. We plainly need um, uh, the government support for the two um, uh, facilities that we have in Old Court Place. That ends in June next year. Um, uh, we need to review the continuing support. Um, but we also need to do that in concert with our partners. So, for example, uh, support around mental health. Um, uh, we, we are doing in cl the closest partnership with uh, the, the NHS. And so we need to make, uh, need to consider what commitments we can make in the future beyond 24. But we, we can't do so in a sort of sovereign, uh, single organisational way. We need to do that particularly, I think, around mental health and about education as well uh, with our partner agencies. But the delivery board that we have that oversees the performance and is the basis for this impact assessment that, that um, Callum spoke about, that actually uh, reports to a delivery partnership board of all the agencies locally, chaired by the leader of the council, and it involves two head teachers. Uh, the CCG, local GP networks, the police, the fire brigade and so on, so that all public sector partners locally are minded about this issue about the 2024 is the, is the sort of uh, forecast horizon and we need to look beyond that. Can I just respond on the reserve? So absolutely, we'll build that into the next draft. So in the same way that we've got 50 million ring fenced, obviously for the recovery strategy, the Grenfell Reserve is a separate reserve. So we'll include that, and I think David picked up on that as well. So you can see the movements through, through the years and track those through. So absolutely, we've got that information. And if I, if I can just add one little bit more information. At, at Appendix 2, you have a, a very small, light synopsis of what is otherwise a sort of 40-page um, resourcing framework that just sets out the funding profile for the next three years. And this is a, a, a difference of how the first two years of the program worked, whereby we were doing sort of single annual budgets. And as we were talking to both of the community and partners about how we could deliver services most effectively, there was an agreement to look at how we, what money was available in each of the different areas so we could plan effectively over the next three years. So almost this year is a bit of a transitional year from where we've been going on an annual budgeting setting to uh, the completion of this resourcing framework, which sets out that three-year horizon. Because I think 
community and partners were unclear about how much money of the 50 million was left for the different initiatives that we'd set out in the uh, original recovery strategy. So, so that's the reason why there is a higher percentage of uh, reserve transfers to essentially fund the, the, the three-year program that's set out. Um, I just have a comment here from uh, Councillor Charles Williams, uh, who sent this through to me. Um, his view is on the Grenfell Expenditure Report, I think that a proper examination of the dedicated service by internal audit is needed, with the focus on what it is doing now and what it will be doing in the next two years, rather than on the past. As part of this internal audit might look at the risk register for this service. Thank you, Chair, and I can assure you we've been having conversations with Callum about exactly about that in terms of the audit plan and in terms of the kind of work we carry out, so I'll take on board what uh, Councillor Williams has suggested there. Okay. Uh, if I can give a bit of additional flavour, we are at the moment undertaking an internal audit of, our, of one part of the system, the application of how the individual services budgets are used to ensure appropriate controls. We have, we have agreed a, a follow-up audit to the quality of the support planning that happens, both to be able to see the progress that families are making, but also um, that the system itself is working. And we've also agreed, um, because I know that there have been concerns expressed about the co-design exercise that we did when we initially set out the dedicated service, that the wide-ranging consultation exercise that subject to a leadership team's decision on Thursday will be commencing for the for the future of the dedicated service that uh, we you know we've agreed that audit will look at that co-design exercise and the consultation to provide more assurance and examination of both the numbers of breeding survivors engaged how they've been engaged and to um, uh, assure the council that um, the figures that we'll be reporting are correct How, how are we going to allay the concerns of some of the residents and groups who are struggling to believe what the council as a collective group is telling them and giving them the numbers and showing them what is being done? You know, there is, there is a call for, for an external independent report, audit. Uh, just putting that question out there so we can discuss it, because I think it's important that we should, and what that would look like. David. The point that I would make is that shortly after the fire, and Barry will attest to this as much as anyone, it wasn't just the council, that it was abundantly clear that the council was actively distrusted, but the NHS, the police, the ambulance service, pretty well every form of authority and actually service provided, many of which were good. And most people like having a GP, and most people like having a school nearby and all the rest of it, and our schools are good. Um, I just say that because that gives a little bit of context to some of the, the challenges of getting people to believe what we may think is very clear and very obvious, but is nevertheless absolutely not shared by everybody. Can you go on and say what you think the solution should be? <laughs> well, all I can say is there was a word that was given to me years ago which was contumacy, which I think expresses the, the disdain of authority. And if you want to look in a dictionary, by all means afterwards do. But there is a challenge which does affect us as local politicians here. It affects officers too, because you are on the ground, and your team, Callum, I know, faces them in a different way to which we do. And I'm sure that some of your officers are trusted and do exactly the same in terms of output to different people. And yet, they are actively distrusted by other local residents. And there's no rhyme or reason, except that some trust you and some don't. Can I just go? Uh, well, I just want to make I mean, a point. I think this is, this I, I is an important the, topic the, the, for. Yes, yeah, so I've raised the point. You've, you, you're, you're, you're trying to ground it, which is good. But I don't think we'll ground it in the discussion today. I, I just like people who've got the bigger picture to be able to put together 
an appropriate report which looks at the pros and cons. I've got a view, but I'd like to see how, the, how those pros and cons balance against each other. My sense is that without somebody from outside with authority and a good quality brand, you will never satisfy those people that uh, um, are, 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 raise, are raising concerns um, by in, in internal work. But I'd like to see it properly argued in a report. Um, I don't know whether it's for this committee or whether it's for another committee or for the council as a whole, but I think it needs to be looked at um, properly. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to, first of all, uh, commend you as the chair and the other committee members for inviting pe speakers from the public for tonight. We can't lose sight of the reason why we're here. Whether there's a lack of trust, we are talking about people who have been grievously harmed, who we are all attempting to do our very best to look after. With that in mind, I wanted to build firstly on the feedback that Councillor Lindsay gave and the spreadsheet view of revenue and capital and expenditure. And I wanted to also build upon something that was mentioned in passing by Callum earlier, which is we are to receive an impact report later this year. I want to now build on Mr. Ling's uh, comments that there has to be a thread from one end to the other. And perhaps there could be some ways to achieve that visibility now that these things are beginning to come to light. We must contemplate the funding sources. We must then translate how that is dispersed through the revenue and capital and expenditure. We need then critically to tie that to the impact after which effectiveness can be measured. And that pivot point between the two committees this one and the next, this evening, could be tied together from end to end through a thread, and perhaps, if appropriate, a joint session could be held. Not dissimilarly to committees that have, in other organizations that have separate finance and audit committees coming together to review reports that have a joint overlapping interest. So that would be one observation that I would make. I was struck also by the comments made about um, Grenfell-centric reporting, not dissimilar to an NHS uh, patient-centric reporting, and note the challenges that that might bring. And perhaps a slightly different perspective could be taken when you consider the impact reporting the impact is to measure goals we have for the people we are trying to help. And through achievement of those goals, be it delivery of rehousing, bereavement services, whatever those things may be, they can be classified into categories, maybe five, six, seven categories of impact and how we can measure that impact and the goals we have for helping these people with those things. I also note the comments that were made about budget versus actual spending, which are um, an interesting thing, and note in particular that the public inquiry, for as long as it goes on, will prevent a full forensic lessons learned experience. Nonetheless, it should not be lost sight of, and it must happen after the fact. Then just a couple of quick comments on a few things in the report. Again, building on Councillor Williams' comments about the internal audit controls, um, one paragraph that struck me on this was paragraph 4.5, where there was a deliberate and conscious choice to use existing processes precisely because they are internally audited. And also, this committee sees clearly the plans for internal audit. What would be helpful, I think, would be to see a complete list of all of the internal audit activity that is specific to Grenfell and what is planned for the future, because certain things will come. To see it alongside the other items uh, means that we may lose perspective on the sweep of all the internal 
audit activity that is specific to this topic. Two last points. I wanted to just circle back to the value for money point and make the observation that perhaps one additional thing that might be explored if it hasn't been yet is carving out that particular point as an exceptional item to, for exclusion. There are times from an accounting perspective that exceptional items are dealt with and noted in a particular way. I, ha I am not an accountant and I have no idea if that's possible. But if that question hasn't been asked, perhaps that's one to consider. And then finally, I wanted to pick up at the very end the comment that was made about support past March 2024. What really struck me in the report is in the note three where there is a particular thinking already about the cliff edge of support past March 2024. That's a quote. What perhaps could also be considered now is some small resource to start thinking about that eventuality, which is really not that far away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Liz, any final comments from you? We're under time pressure. Um, Barry, is there any comment you'd like to make after hearing our independent co-opted members? No, I feel that uh, we could, what would be useful would be a briefing to, our, to the members on, on these issues. Um, I think it'd be really important, by, both by ourselves, but, but also by independent people who we've uh, engaged for these purposes. Because then that may give you some assurance um, about uh, the work's done so far, but also future, uh, the future focus. But uh, I do think that that briefing would be a very useful thing. I think uh, direct briefing without, you know, goodbye, people are supporting independently as well as um, officers. Agreed. Um, well, we're reaching the end of our time. And again, mindful of the minute takers um, and to what we've sort of agreed we're going to look at. So I think we all need to, we need to get the minutes out quite quickly with the action tracker. Well, I suppose let's get the action tracker out first to make sure that everything is not captured on there for the members to look at. Um, you know, certainly we need the reserves analysis is on there. Further breakdown of the dedicated service to make it more granular. Um, Charles Williams's risk register for the dedicated service. Um, David's financial breakdown, I'm calling it, um, uh, in terms of the income and expenditure, really putting this into a sort of P&L perspective to make it very clear for um, financial people to understand where the money's come in and where it's gone throughout the years, with, with narrative backing it up. That's, yeah, That's, there's going to be a fair amount of work in that. Um, what else have we got? Um, impacts assessments that Callum was going to start looking at. Um, we've then got to look at the answers to, this, to the questions from the public speakers. Um, and we as a committee need, need sight of that because that is going to bring out more questions. Is there anything specifically I've missed that anyone wants to reiterate so that it can be minuted and, and put in the action platter? No. Great. Um, we're out of time. Anything else we need to do, Vice Chair? Um, well, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, and for those of you who are going on to the next meeting back here in half an hour, um, I hope that goes well. Um,
as I said, this is the start of the sort of process, and I thought I thought it was a good start. Um, uh, I know there's a lot more work for the officers to do, um, and I think certainly for our, our independent members, it was extremely important to have to allow people to speak. It really does contextualise it and and um, uh, allows you to understand the the situation and the grievances they feel, but also the distrusts they feel and and how we as a committee can help them overcome that distrust. I hope we did a bit of that today, um, but we need to continue to think about how we can do that. Yes. Uh, David, the, the joint meeting with the OSC. Um, it's, well, uh, I think we both asked for it. It's a good idea, yeah. if, if we can. Um, I, won't, I won't stay this evening, David, on the hoof, but I think it needs to settle. But I think, there is a, as Gazette said, there's a good parallel with organisations yeah. who have finance and audit committees. They, they do come together on some issues, and I think we could do that with the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Okay. I, I, okay. I'm on the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and my suggestion is we might have one September, October. So we've had several more attempts to get good quality information here, so that in terms of our, well, your assurance particular, Andrew, because you're closer to um, being an auditor than I am. Um, mm -hmm. The moment to do it is the impact report availability, because yeah. yeah. that's the key to the whole thing, I think. Uh, and um, the impact report 